I'm going to head off and start with, uh, with my presentation called uh, The Design of Everyday Things. Um, my name is Imre Gemelig Meiling. I'm not going to get into the name, but I'm Dutch. The name is not. Um, I worked at Crimson Drupal Architects, still do, really, but uh, as of this week, as you may know, we are Wunderkraut. At Crimson, I'm doing the, uh, the operations. Um, I'm helping op out with the marketing and uh, involved in some project management as well. And I'll be focusing on the uh, expansion towards Holland as of now. If you find something interesting in this session, I would kindly ask you to uh, use the, the hashtag Norman Door. I'm going to explain to you in a little bit what that's about. Um, my background is uh, uh, user experience design, interface design. Um, I worked with Drupal since um, 2006. I was involved in development, um, interface development in Lotus Notes applications before that and Java applications. And um, so then there's, um, I got involved in project management, team management, and uh, now I'm not into the technology so much as uh, all the things around Drupal. So the title for my presentation is from this book, The Design of Everyday Things. It's written by um, Donald Norman. He's the um, old and wise looking guy there on the right. Uh, he's co-founder and principal of the Nielsen Norman Group, together with Jacob Nielsen, the uh, usability guy that you may have heard of. And they do um, a usability analysis and studies, and they, um, they sell the, uh, the findings and um, Donald Norman also uh, was a professor at several universities in uh, the United States and the United Kingdom. And he, um, well, got involved in uh, um, uh, behavioral studies and uh, um, user analysis and, and such. And I, I think it's, um, um, I want to uh, touch some themes in this book. And I think it's a wonderful book that I think everyone uh, involved in, in product development and software development particularly should read. Uh, there are some pretty good things in there. Um, the presentation is not so much about uh, how, to, how to design things well. Um, the presentation uh, just before this one had some wonderful points. I mean, there are many presentations and guidelines on, on how to design things well, but I um, sort of uh, hope to invite you to look at the things that we all use on a daily basis a little bit differently, and also the things that we make as, as Drupal developers, project managers, as a team for ourselves, basically, within Drupal, but also for our clients and the websites that we make for our clients. So um, I don't have many bullet lists, I don't have many Drupal slides, but uh, I have some one great examples, I think, of, uh, um, well, a design fails and even a touch base with Drupal, of course. So the bad design of everyday things one of the central themes in the book is that um, users uh, often get blamed for doing things wrong uh, or they blame themselves, right? And um, at Crimson, we have a professional support services and I, I regularly see uh, support issues that start with, hey, um, it must be me who is doing something wrong, but can you, can you please help me out here? Um, so. Norman states, if an error can occur, somebody will make it. And it's, it's, it's this theme that I, uh, I want to focus on in this, uh, in this presentation. Technology changes rapidly, people change slowly. Um, I think that uh, one of the key points is that as new, te new technology uh, emerges, as new uh, software versions come out, um, the people behind those, the companies, uh, the, the developers that make them, they forget the lessons of the past uh, when it comes to putting the user first. It's often driven by um, uh, marketing departments that want stuff in there. Um, we want to put as many uh, functionalities as, as possible in there, um, and we forget to, um, to focus on, on the user. Um, so I think that uh, the people who uh, the wonderful developers that the um, that even the Drupal community is rich, of course. Um, they 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 make wonderful functionalities. It's it's great code. It works well, but they are I think they're a lot of times they are ahead of their users. 
So here's uh, uh, the Norman door. Um, it's, a, it's a photo that I took from, uh, from Donald Norman's website. Um, I don't know where, where it's located exactly, but um, um, how, how often do you walk into a door that you're supposed to pull and you push it or uh, the other way around, right? You just, I, I had this this morning even in this hotel and you just slam into it. Um, and if you look closely at this, uh, at the same door, you see uh, um, um, a marvelous piece of work, really. Some designer uh, uh, really worked um, on a great sticker with all the typographic uh, things at the left, and it's, it says in German, push and pull. But as you can see uh, at the previous slide, in the glare of the sun, it's, it's hard to tell, right? So you just, you know, it's a work of art, and art doesn't have to, to work, it just has to be appreciated, right? <laughs> right, so, uh, Often with some, some small visual cues, uh, usability improves drastically uh, without getting obtrusive, right? So more doors. Um, here's a photo that I took at the, uh, the local supermarket and I go there uh, every Saturday to do groceries. And uh, in Holland, um, from what I gather from my Belgian colleagues and my uh, English in-laws is that we're, we're sort of famous for our dairy products. We have a lot of them a lot of sweet uh, milk-based desserts and products, and there's like an aisle of 30 meters of refrigerated cells with this stuff, right? Um, and, you know, the, you have to open the door at the, uh, the, the slightly embossed latch, but you, it's hard to tell the difference because the hinge side is, is almost identical. And, you know, I don't have very long fingernails, but I, um, I often crack one when I try to open the wrong side, and I observe other people doing that as well. And there's this obscure yellow note at the hinge side. Um, so there's a, a space of about two meters um, with a doorway leading to the back of the store. And then there's the deep freezer cells. And they put handles there. And the yellow note is at the handle side. And that one works. Right. I never designed a building before I've seen the site and met the people who will be using it. Um, I think it's a great quote that applies to us all too. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, he was an American architect who apparently worked on, uh, on a thousand buildings and completed like 500 books. Um, so I took this photo from the, uh, the building that I, uh, I, um, I worked previously and it was a, it was a cool building. It was, a, it was actually um, featured in some, uh, some design magazine. Um, but the, the, the array of buttons at the front of the, uh, the building, they controlled all the lights and there were exterior lights, and it had like an open floor. You could look up onto the first floor, but you couldn't see what lights you switched off with every of the buttons. So what happened was is that the last one to leave, sometimes me, uh, sometimes others, but uh, we, would, we would be um, coming into the office the next day, and lights would still be burning, right? Where in fact we might have turned on the lights because the, uh, the switches weren't marked. Um, so here's a, a screenshot. Um, I'm sorry, it's in Dutch, but uh, it's obviously the, uh, the publication settings for, uh, for Drupal. And we tend to deliver our projects with um, uh, handing out information to our clients on um, adding keywords and some SEO stuff in there, right? And what you see is that, um, that our clients tend to click on everything and they fill out everything. And then sometimes things conflict or mix up or they, you know, they are marked, there's a clutter there, so. Um, okay, different example. Here is the, um, the remote control for a Siemens cartridge type uh, AC unit, a square one in the, in the ceiling. Um, well, in, in Holland we have hot days, we have cold days, um, but we use the uh, AC unit daily, right? And we always had uh, troubles with the remote control by which it, you know, since it was in the ceiling, you rely on the remote control. And there are several buttons on there, but you know, the M swing and the A swing were the most am ambiguous ones to us. So we actually had a support engineer from Siemens come in explaining to a small team what the buttons did. <laughs> and then, you know, obviously some people were ill or I was out that day and uh, uh, I missed that. Um, 
So, you know, uh, for four years when, when it was installed, we had, we had a, a fighting with the Siemens AC. We actually had a, a, um, a copy of uh, part of the manual uh, that was lying around so people could look it up. Anyway, we used it daily, but we had, uh, we had a lot of struggle. And here is the tiny MCE editor with two very similar buttons. Um, and we used this in our projects. Uh, and there was one particular project for a client last year that had a lot of content, like uh, several thousand pages, right? It was an informational site. It was very uh, content rich. And what happened was is that um, apparently the, um, uh, the, the website went to production with like thousands of staging URLs because the client had been using the wrong button, right? And we tend to blame the client, but is it really the client's fault? Anyway, we make good websites, though. <laughs> right, so um, another example that I, uh, um, I, I took this photo, I had it uh, from the internet, but um, we have these kinds of uh, slide locks at our uh, parking lots when you get your parking ticket and you can get back to your car when you uh, slide the car through the lock, right, and the door opens. But I always tend, tend to get the, um, the sort of icon the wrong way, you know, it's like the... Uh, the stereograms with, uh, with all the noise and you have to look at it real long and then I always see this in the reversed way and I just, I just can't tune my head uh, to see it the right way and I have this with this as well and I always, you know, there's, it happens wrong all the time. Where here is one from the Citizen M Hotel at Schiphol Amsterdam and it says to all latecomers, party people and witches, after midnight place your card on this scanner to enter. You know, and you get the card that you get when at check-in, you just have to hold it near and the door opens. It's, it's, it's easy, you know. It's a, I think it's a, a nicely designed with some witty remark. And it's, it's nice and it works well, better at least. Right. Um, flight safety instructions galore. I took this uh, from a wonderful book that I have, Open Here, The Art of Instructional Design. Um, by the way, I have a resources sheet at the end. Um, it contains all the, the books and the links and uh, the blog posts and uh, links to the uh, 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 to everything uh, that I um, that I touch here, including some more. So um, you don't need to write it down. But um, anyway, the um, the actual page is a flip out, so it's twice as big. And what struck me is um, that with each type of airplane, times the types of the number of airline companies, there is like some new design for the safety instructions, right? So whenever there's like a new uh, 707 coming out, it seems to me that there is some designer who, who uh, uh, they go up to and say, hey, okay, here's, here's another 50,000 and just, you know, uh, work from scratch, give us something new. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I came here by flight uh, and what I see is that, um, you know, when uh, the stewards and the stewardesses, they, um, they give the instructions on how this works, but everybody opens their, their laptops and their iPads, right? So anyway, what could, what could go wrong in flight, right? Um, but here's another example. It's a roundabout. Uh, it's near my house. And um, in Holland, there's a lot of tax uh, euros that go to infrastructure. And I'm, to be honest, I'm quite quite proud on how they do that because everything is in the right shape and in the right order. Obviously, we have a tiny country, so there's not much to uh, to maintain, right? Um, but here, cars have to yield, so the cyclists go first. So the, the triangles that you see over there, they indicate that the cars have to stop and the cyclists go first. And we have a lot of bicycles in, in Holland. Holland is a bicycle country. So just a kilometer from there, the cyclists yield before the cars, right? And this roundabout is governed by a small town, the next town, so not the same. And, uh, well, behind the bush is a pool. I have a nine-year-old who goes there on, uh, on his bike uh, from time to time. And uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm worried uh, and I'm amazed that, that nothing has gone wrong and I hope nothing ever will, but there's, there's a huge inconsistency there, I think, in, in, in a, a basic... In, in system where you interface with the world. Right, end user license agreements. Um, uh, I, when I got my HTC Desire phone uh, last year, uh, it came um, with a Google uh, premium navigation app and it works quite well. 
Um, so when I when I um, um, first started to work with uh, with Crimson, I had a, a rental car, and it didn't have sat nav, it didn't have a G, a GPS navigation. So I was I was relying on my phone to uh, to to drive to Brussels and visit clients. Uh, I don't know the way in Brussels. I can't imagine someone does, but <laughs> in any case. Uh, while I was driving on the freeway, 120 kilometers an hour when this popped up, and I had to go through all 40 pages of license agreement because it has a very small screen, right? And then, then I had to purchase uh, a license with my credit card. Can you imagine that? So I was, I was relying on my, you know, a critical piece of interface with the world, uh, and I was sort of amazed that, uh, that they didn't include some form of uh, piece of intelligence that uh, that showed me this after my drive, right? I believe it's a Route 66 thing, actually, but um, the rest of it works quite well. And this is the feeling that I get from from such, you know, this the the, the white tiles, the ribbon tiles are for blind people, with the white cane. <laughs> I'm not trying to make fun with blind people, of course, but. Um, there's a there's a different type of uh, of ribbon at when they have to cross, but uh, somebody in his in his right mind put a stone there. So anyway, this is end user license agreements for me, uh, and I have an, an, another remarkable uh, image. Blah. So you know who 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 has actually read the um, the update for the license agreement on your iPad or on your iPhone when it came out? All Back to back, all 40 pages. Who read those? Raise hands. No, that's what I thought and hoped. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm confronted with end user license agreement daily. Uh, we have one in the um, in the hotel when we uh, when we use internet, and it's I mean it's great internet. It's fast, it's cheap, but uh, everybody clicks it away, right? It's like a pop up. Uh, and um, I'm looking for the button. Don't bother me again. Next. And there's people around me, um, you know, I'm, I'm computer savvy, I'd like to think so, but there's people around me who, who don't even read the important pop-ups, right? So I, I'm not saying that, uh, that end user license agreement, they are, I mean, they're not that they're not important, they're an important part of, uh, of uh, you know, the things that we do, software that we make, they, uh, they belong with that. But um, there was a, a great example that I um, that I once found. I, I couldn't find it in time for the presentation, but um, or I couldn't find it back. But it said, "Well, um, we need to uh, to um, uh, offer you the license agreement. You're not going to read it anyway, so click here. But if you want, click here." So, Drupal, um, right? So. Um, Drupal did a, uh, there was a usability study for Drupal um, early on this year in February. Uh, it was held at Google and they took eight technology savvy people from Google. And as usability studies go, they have like this usability script that they uh, post to people and they ask them questions and tasks to do. Uh, and then they observe them and it was recorded. Um, so what they did is they, um, um, they put uh, some essential Drupal functionalities uh, to the test, including um, uh, content creation, um, interfaces like views and styles and such. Um, so when you go to the URL, the report is there, the findings are there, the de there's a, even a detailed report and there's a breakdown uh, into issues that you can help work out with. So I think that's, that's a great thing how to do that. I don't want, want to, uh, to get into that, uh, into the details now, but I, I do want to go over the, um, the findings real, real uh, briefly. So what they, uh, what they concluded was that a new user feels confused and overwhelmed by Drupal's presentation of features and options, alienated by unexplained t terminology throughout Drupal, helpless because of a perceived lack of support, in the dark about the extent of Drupal's capabilities, and uncertain about her uh, his or her progress while performing tasks uh, and stupid because they assumed they are drooping, uh, using Drupal incorrectly, which was one of the central themes that I started out with. Um, so from, from Deez's keynote yesterday, I saw some remarkable things on what they did with usability. So um, obviously a lot of things are, are happening and are improving. Um, uh, anyway, so I, I wanted to, uh, to um, 
to show you this, that uh, all the examples and all the fun things that I, that I showed just now, they also happen in Drupal. Um, so Norman states, if an error can occur, somebody will make it. Um, there are a few principles on, you know, why people make these mistakes, and I wanted to, uh, to touch with those uh, briefly. Um, so these t-shirts were tested on animals, they didn't fit. <laughs> I think this is a great, this is a great slide that will, that will work uh, uh, in almost any case. But uh, a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to under underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools, says Douglas Adams. He's the writer for um, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? And this is about users don't uh, always make the best choices. Uh, they don't always use the quickest way to find information, and they don't read web pages in a linear fashion, right? Uh, and I've seen um, both clients as well as, as the people around me um, looking for things that were just like screaming to their faces like a big button at the top, and they're missing that, right? So instead, users, uh, they, they satisfy which is a term, uh, I believe, coined by Steve Crook, the uh, author for uh, Don't Make Me Think. It's a great book, a must read as well. Um, so it's a combination of uh, that they try to find whatever, uh, is whatever satisfies and suffices. So whenever they, they see something that might remotely um, uh, uh, hold what they're looking for, they click, right? Uh, it's an important thing to, uh, to take into mind. Um, another thing is use metaphors and words. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, this is a photo of a, of a, of a box uh, from Cool Blue. It's a, an, a hardware retail shop that we have in uh, Belgium and the Netherlands, and it sells all sorts of things of laptops and razors and tablets and uh, dishwashers, I believe. Uh, and I, I love the way how they handle the entire process from ordering to, uh, to delivering your package uh, to, uh, to returning it when, when something is wrong. Uh, yeah, I like the thing, uh, what they did with the icons, like uh, you can't use a blowtorch to open, you can't use an ax, you can't use a saw, but you can use a knife and you can use scissors. But, you know, when using icons, uh, the thing is, you know, when you're relying on, on metaphors, people may not understand it, or worse, they, make it, they may take it too literally. And I've seen people opening up such packages with a, a knife, screwing up, screwing up their uh, contents, right? So the uh, case that I want to make is um, metaphors and words work best. Uh, there's no intuitive interface, not even the nipple. It's all learned. So when I submitted my, um, my session on the DrupalCon uh, um, website, I stated things don't uh, often don't work intuitively, right? And that there's often a mismatch between how things are made and how things, uh, how we perceive uh, things intuitively in the world. And the thing is that users follow their intuition based on past experiences, right? Um, they employ metaphors that are consistent with, with what they have already learned. But the, um, the thing is, um, they have to be wrong, you know, there's misconceptions there, there's only half-truths. So, you know, I would make the case that there, there cannot be an intuitive interface, you know? And you will run into the, um, um, there's, there's a lot of ambitious people out there, uh, designers who will make the case that uh, your interface should uh, not require any learning on the part of the user, right? And I think that's not possible. So that's when you bring out the nipple remark. Okay, so uh, how we really use the web. Um, this is from uh, Don't Make Me Think, Steve Crook that I mentioned earlier, and uh, I think it's a great slide on you know the difference between how we, how often uh, things are designed in a certain way, even you know applications in a very linear fashion. Uh, your clients uh, also think in a very linear fashion. We want to put up this first and then this and they use this eye tracing software uh, to find out, you know, how, how users really use the web. Um, and this was really an eye-opener eye when, uh, when, uh, when I first saw this. So, um, 
um, a um, short sum up. Poor usability results in anger and frustration, uh, which is what I, what I had when, uh, when using my Google navigation. Uh, decreased productivity in the workplace, higher error rates, uh, physical and emotional injury. Uh, one of the cases that, uh, that uh, Donald Norman is, uh, is uh, expanding about is um, he got involved in the, um, in a, in an ex um, um, in the study after the, an accident with a nuclear power plant in the United States. Um, and I showed you the, uh, the example uh, of the, uh, the roundabouts. Um, and, well, I, I hope that there, that there won't be uh, some physical uh, injury there, but it can. Um, equipment damage, loss of customer loyalty. Um, so I, I, I spoke to, uh, to Steve Parks the other day, and he, uh, he did a great job of, uh, of actually uh, winning back a client that was so done with Drupal after two... Uh, apparently, uh, uh, projects that went totally amiss um, because of, 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 you know, the the client struggling with uh, with the way it was constructed, and it costs money. Um, so, if you go to uh, to Donald Norman's website, um, the link is in the the resources slide. He has some. Uh, there there are many uh, uh, usability studies, uh, really, uh, but there are some that that actually. Uh, um, have made calculations uh, on you know the the minutes and 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 seconds lost, especially you know on in online applications and, and relatively large organizations, the time that is lost you know because of poor usability and it costs money. Okay, so um, I, I I didn't want to uh, to leave out some at least some guidelines and some uh, you know uh, help on uh, on how to uh, to improve things that we make. And uh, I think it's important to, uh, to, uh, to stress that uh, I don't believe it's just uh, uh, the designer's responsibility. So I may, I've used uh, the term uh, design a lot, but uh, there are some, as I said, many, there are many Drupal developers, uh, many uh, of you who create uh, functionalities that are ready to plug in, that we use, that we employ, in helping our clients, and, and you guys also make uh, the interfaces. You also, you guys also create on you know how that works, how we need to operate it. So uh, this, I, I think it's it's important for everyone to to consider that um, you know uh, um, making things usable is a task for all of us as a team, but also individually. Dilbert Engineering. Uh, is, is there anyone who doesn't know this slide? I, okay, good. So uh, we have it on our office wall. Uh, I, I think it, it's a great illustration on, you know, uh, the difference between, uh, um, you know, wh how we make things and how, uh, uh, well, it speaks for itself. Um, I want to get into the uh, psychology of, uh, of user usability a little bit by, um, um, explain a little bit about uh, design models and user models, also known as conceptual models and mental models. And it's all about knowing your user and managing his expectations, right? So a conceptual model is how you uh, think it up, how you make it, right? Uh, and a user model is uh, basically how the user perceives the things that we make, the things that you make, um, you know? and. Designers often, and developers as well, don't, often don't speak with end users. And, you know, as a result, you have suboptimal uh, implementations, suboptimal sub products. Um, and when you don't uh, think of uh, um, a proper user model, when you don't consider your user and how he will perceive the thing that you will be making it, users are forced to make up their own user model, right? And as I stated, they're, they're they're prone to be wrong because they are based on misconceptions, incomplete facts, past experiences with other things. So I think the, um, the uh, design model and user model are, is a cri critical component into, into any software development, into any module development, everything that we, that we make here. Still, you may be thinking, well, you know, um, uh, what of it? What, is, what has that uh, to do with me? Um, and I think it's cheaper for a reason. 
it's uh, it's all about the misconceptions between uh, the the you know the um, difference between what your user expects and what you create for him, right? Um, so when there is there is a difference between the uh, the conceptual model and the mental model, your users will find your your module, your website, your online application hard to learn and hard to use, right? Often I think that. Uh, that uh, you know, we, we will force the way how we make things, the conceptual model, onto your users, and you need to, to change what's in the head of your users. You want to adapt the user's mental model onto your conceptual model, which is, which is training, and which is basically what training should be all about. So, um, providing feedback is critical. It's very important to uh, to let let uh, let know what's happening. Otherwise, uh, people uh, send their prints like eight times. They turn their uh, computer off and on. <laughs> uh, and it, to be honest, it took me quite a while to find out that the um, the um, OSX Finder is only done uh, searching when the title reverts back to the uh, to the folder where you're at, right? And uh, I, I will imagine that there are many people who, uh, who will be having this question, but uh, so provide feedback is important. Provide constraints. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the, uh, 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 the ticketing machine at the Dutch railways. At every railway station, we have uh, ticketing machines with this with this um, system on, and I I think it's a uh, it's great, it's clean, and it's it has very clear constraints. So you have to go from left to right. And at the end, you will have to pay uh, if you forget a step or skip one or uh, do something wrong. They have very visual clues, very clear, um, and very constrained. Affordances. Um, affordances is all about how do I go about using this thing. Uh, there's many more in uh, uh, Donald Norman's book about this. Um, but uh, remember the weight in Drupal where you have to um, to put in the weight, obviously, to, uh, to change the order. And I actually had clients uh, asking, say, okay, if I put in like minus five, does it float up or does it sink down, right? And affordances is where you make visually clear uh, how it works, right? So now we have like, we can, we can slide things up and down, which is a great way to, uh, to improve based on affordances. The trunk test, um, it's, I, I think, is a great tool. Uh, it's also on our on our office wall. Um, it's all it, this, this is from Steve Crook. Uh, don't make me think as well. And it's about um, you getting uh, into a trunk blindfolded, taken out, blindfolded off, and you have to tell like in seconds where you're at, right? So uh, the important uh, important questions that you will have to be able to answer in like seconds is what website is this? The site idea. What page am I on? What are the major sections of this website or primary navigation? What are my options at this level, secondary navigation? Where am I in the scheme of things, the breadcrumbs? Uh, and how can I search? Uh, it's, a, it's a great tool and I suggest that, uh, that you take, into, uh, take this into account with, uh, with all your designers and developers and hang it on the, uh, on the, uh, on the office wall. Jonathan Ivey. He's a senior vice president, industrial design at Apple Inc. And he designed the, um, the iPhone and the iMac and the iBook. Um, um, so, well, you probably have heard about him. Uh, there's a great interview in the, the Daily Telegraph. And he says, it's the finishing the back of the drawer. You can argue that people will never see it. And it's very hard to describe why it's important. But it just seems important. It's a way that you demonstrate that you care for the people that you're making these products for. And I think we see ourselves as having a civic responsibility to do that. It's important, it's right, but it's very hard to explain why. So, uh, uh, another snapshot of my favorite box. <laughs> so this is uh, from Cool Blue again. And at the bottom they, uh, they have this nice little thing that says, ingredients, wood pulp, paper, some Pantone colors, air bubble bags, some special skills, a lot of love, and of course your order. Now, this is a physical product, right? And we're, we're all in the business of making software. Uh, but I think that this applies as much to the things that we make in, in our you know, daily modules in our software as it does in, in products. And in fact, at uh, Crimson, we have um, 
a physical box that we hand out to clients, and it has some, uh, some important documents and a sign-off document and some goodies and a book. Uh, and it, it, it serves as a milestone for clients to say, okay, we're done for you, project is finished, and another phase, the support phase, starts here. Uh, here's a snapshot of the website. So um, one of the great things that I think they did is that at the top it states you have eight hours and 90 minutes to ensure delivery tomorrow. And you know, when I, I don't know about you, but when I order something from the internet, I want it fast. You know, it's nice to have, to receive real mail, to receive packages and open it up, right? So, but it's also a great incentive to, you know, to order now. So I know when it's going to get there, but it also urges me to, to make that purchase. Uh, so I think that's a nice little detail that they, um, there are many more, but um, anyway, so another thing, how, how many, uh, is there anyone who knows how to, uh, to do the copyright symbol on Mac? How do you do that? How do you do the, uh, the uh, copyright symbol on Mac? How do you type that? Yeah, it's option G. Anyway, I have to look it up all the time. <laughs> Uh, and same thing with uh, the euro sign, it's even harder for us. And I believe in Windows it's like Alt-0169 for the copyright, but uh, anyway, you know, this is, this is um, they're not doing everything right at Apple. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm um, going quite fast, but I'm almost through. Um, I wanted to show you a, a very short video reel of uh, Guy Kawasaki, and uh, he was a um, he wrote um, a book called Enchantment and the Art of Start. Um, and he was also involved at the, uh, the technology uh, division at Apple. Um, and he's, uh, he's giving a lecture to, uh, to people setting up a, comp a company. So he's, uh, he's talking to young entrepreneurs. But I think the, uh, the things that he says apply as much uh, to all of us working in our companies and working for our clients because we're all basically in that business. So. I'm going to see if I can get that started. The first thing I figured out and learned, sometimes the hard way, about entrepreneurship is that the core, the essence of entrepreneurship is about making meaning. Many, many people start companies to make money, the quick flip, the dot-com <coughs> phenomena. And I have noticed in both the companies that I've started and funded and been associated with that those companies that that are, f are fundamentally founded to change the world, to make the world a better place, to make meaning, are the companies that make a difference. They are the companies to succeed. My naive and romantic belief is that if you make meaning, you will probably make money. But if you set out to make money, you will probably not make meaning and you won't make money. So my first thought is you need to make meaning. That should be the core of why you start a company. There are three ways to make meaning. First is to increase the quality of life. My background is the Macintosh division of Apple Computer, and I can tell you with total certainty that we were not motivated by making money. We were motivated by changing the world to make people more creative and more productive. We were trying to increase the quality of life for the Macintosh user. And that was a great motivation. It kept us going through many, many difficult periods. We were waking up in the morning thinking how we could change people's lives. A second way to make meaning is to right a wrong. You know, the, this fish is going to die after jumping out. But to right a wrong means that you, you find something that's wrong in the world, or you notice something that's wrong, or you want to fix that. Um, this might be particularly applicable to not-for-profits where you know there's pollution, or there's crime, or there's abuse, and they just their very core is to to end that wrong. And the third way to make meaning is to prevent the end of something good that you see something beautiful, something wonderful, and you just can't stand the fact that it's been eroded, it's being changed, it's being ruined. So I ask you, as you start your companies, your not-for-profits, your churches, your schools, whatever you're starting, please have one of those three motivations, one or more of those motivations. If you don't have any of those motivations, I suggest that you rethink what you're doing. I think these three things are the key to starting a great organization. Right, so um, this, is, this is really a roundup to uh, uh, the principles of design thinking 
I think it's important that you know your users and you align with your users' mental models. And as I as stated just now, I don't think that's uh, just just uh, a thing for designers, but uh, for all of us, for uh, designers and developers alike, and product owners and everyone involved, to uh, to know your user, know what goes on in their heads, uh, and to uh, to look at the things that you make for them uh, from their end, uh, primarily. You know, Devel developers, uh, designers, uh, you developers also use coffee machines and and dishwashers and vacuum cleaners, and you don't want 12 buttons on your vacuum cleaner just to provide so many functions on there, right? You just want like three switches at most. Provide appropriate feedback uh, in everything that we make. Um, let, let, um, let the user know what's happening. Um, eliminate the opportunity for error as much as you can, right? And all things you make will have to make meaning. So. This is the resources slide. It's on SlideShare. Um, it has all the links. Um, you can click on it, and it, it takes you to all the books and everything. Uh, there's some some additional things there as well. There's a rework. Um, the guys behind Basecamp. That's a great book, a must read at our office. Uh, you really want to uh, to rip out some pages and put it on your wall. Uh, Welcome to Macintosh is a great documentary. Um, well, Smashing Magazine, of course. So have a look there. Um, and that's it for me. So it's, it's sort of my little gimmick. If you uh, see a Norman door uh, and have the time to tweet it, use the hashtag Norman door, and uh, we'll try to make a collection uh, of our own. Um, so the slides are on SlideShare. And uh, if you were willing to provide some feedback for me and the uh, DrupalCon organization, then uh, please go to my session note afterwards. That's it. Are there any questions? There aren't. Good. <laughs> well, it didn't have that many technical details, obviously. So, okay. Thank you, then.